God is saying everything is aligning perfectly for you. Very soon you will be amazed by how well everything turned out. Let go and trust. All my desired manifestations will soon unfold into my life. I choose to surrender to the universe and trust that everything that is meant to happen will happen. I will remain at peace and centered in the present moment. I am here on earth with a purpose. Dear God, I pray about all these things and ask you to handle my problems, but yet I still check on them and worry. Today I come to you in prayer to ask that you allow me to fully release control. I shouldn't ask you to take care of something for me, then wonder if it's being handled yet or if you even will help me. You are not on my time, I am on yours. Let me be so confident in you that I just know with everything in my soul that when I ask you for something in prayer with faith, I shall receive, no matter how long it takes. Your timing is perfect, and you know what's best for me. Show me how to stop trying to control everything that happens in my life. You are the controller, the ruler, and the king of my life and of everything. Dear God, I humbly come before you today in prayer to ask that you single me out from others. Make my journey and personality so unique and authentic. Bless me with an identity that is one of none. Remind me that my spiritual walk is not the same as others. Let me feel your spirit on me at all times. Allow me to use my testimonies and my past to change lives and help bring people closer to you. Prevent me from desiring things of this world and comparing myself to others. Please keep me aligned with my purpose and only leave room in my life for growth. Thank you, Lord. Dear God, when things are not going my way, do not allow me to quit. I much prefer them to go your way anyway. I know that the plans you have for me are way bigger than I can imagine. You have way more for me to see and experience. I ask that you bless me with strength to get up every day and strive for the life I desire and the life you have planned for me. Show me how to be the best version of myself, the version you have visioned for me. Prepare me for any obstacles that I may face along the way. You allowed me to make it this far. I can't quit now. Every great success story requires struggle. I am taking it step by step with you. I trust you, and I am all in with you. Dear God, lately I have been feeling like we are not as close as we used to be. I don't like this feeling at all. I don't feel as whole and as complete without your presence. I know that you truly haven't left my side, but sinner's guilt and the enemy is trying to trick me into thinking that you are angry at me and rejecting me. Forgive me for all my sins. Please do not let me allow sin to get in the way of our bond. I rebuke all destruction and doubts and send them back to hell. I only want to live pure and righteously so that I could be closer to you and your presence. Please wash away any guilt and shame from my heart. Whenever I feel that you are drifting away from me, may your presence weigh heavier in my life. I love you, God. Thank you. Dear God, lately I have been feeling like we are not as close as we used to be. I don't like this feeling at all. I don't feel as whole and as complete without your presence. I know that you truly haven't left my side, but sinner's guilt and the enemy is trying to trick me into thinking that you are angry at me and rejecting me. Forgive me for all my sins. Please do not let me allow sin to get in the way of our bond. I rebuke all destruction and doubts and send them back to hell. I only want to live pure and righteously so that I could be closer to you and your presence. Please wash away any guilt and shame from my heart. Whenever I feel that you are drifting away from me, may your presence weigh heavier in my life. I love you, God. Thank you. Dear God, you better than anyone know people's intentions for me. 
I often welcome the wrong people with open arms into my life, and I need your help to clear them out. Please protect me against any evil eyes, monitoring spirits, and people that watch me closely just waiting for me to fail. I ask that with your power you destroy and scatter any evil plans against me. I blind the eyes of any monitoring spirit that was sent my way to monitor my life in order to plan my destruction. You are my refuge and fortress. I count on you for protection and guidance. Please give all your angels charge over me. Thank you, Lord. Your pain often reveals God's purpose for you. God never wastes a hurt. If you've gone through a hurt, God wants you to help other people going through that same hurt. He can use the problems in your life to give you a ministry to others. In fact, the very thing that you're most ashamed of or that you resent the most could become your greatest ministry. Who can better help somebody going through a bankruptcy than somebody who went through a bankruptcy? Who can better help somebody struggling with an addiction than somebody who struggled with an addiction? Who can better help somebody who's lost a child than somebody who lost a child? The very thing you hate the most in your life is what God wants to use for good in your life and in the lives of other people. The Bible says, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. 2 Corinthians 1, 4, 6. This is called redemptive suffering. When God eventually uses the pain you've gone through for the benefit of others. This is what Jesus did. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't deserve to die. He went through that pain for your benefit so that you could be saved and go to heaven. The problems, pain, and suffering in your life have many causes. Sometimes you bring them on yourself through poor decisions. For example, you presume on the future by buying things you can't afford. Then you go deeply in debt and eventually lose your house. In that situation, you can't say, God, why did you let me lose my house? You can't blame God for your bad choices. But in some of your problems, you're innocent. You've been hurt by the pain, stupidity, and sins of other people. But no matter the source of your pain, God can redeem it. He can bring you through a time of suffering and let you help other on the other side. Growth requires a teachable attitude. While you were given a brand new nature at the moment of conversion, you still have old habits, patterns, and practices that need to be removed and replaced. We are afraid to humbly face the truth about ourselves. We often build our identities around our defects. We say, it's just like me to be, and it's just the way I am. The unconscious worry is that if I let go of my habit, my hurt, or my hang-up, who will I be? This fear can definitely slow down your growth. Only as God is allowed to shine the light of His truth on our faults, failures, and hang-ups, can we begin to work on them. This is why you cannot grow without a humble, teachable attitude. Godly habits take time to develop. Remember that your character is the sum total of your habits. You can't claim to have integrity unless it is your habit to always be honest. Your habits define your character. There is only one way to develop the habits of Christ-like character. You must practice them, and that takes time. These character-building habits are often called spiritual disciplines, and they include such things as meditation, prayer, fasting, Bible study, simplicity, solitude, and submission. Although God could instantly transform us, He has chosen to develop us slowly. Why does it take so long to change and grow up? There are several reasons. We are slow learners. We often have to relearn a lesson 40 or 50 times to really get it. The problems keep recurring and we think, not again, 
I've already learned that, but God knows better. We need repeated exposure. We have a lot to unlearn. Many people go to a counselor with a personal or relational problem that took years to develop and say, I need you to fix me. I've got an hour. Since most of our problems and all of our bad habits didn't develop overnight, it's unrealistic to expect them to go away immediately. Growth is often painful and scary. There is no growth without change. There is no change without fear or loss. And there is no loss without pain. We fear these losses, even if our old ways were self-defeating, because like a worn-out pair of shoes, they were at least comfortable and familiar. Every change involves a loss of some kind. You must let go of old ways in order to experience the new. When people hurt us, we have two natural tendencies, to remember and to retaliate. But that's not what 1 Corinthians 13.5 tells us to do. Love does not count up wrongs that have been done. So how should you respond to the people who have hurt you? How do you handle all of those wounds and hurts that you've stockpiled in your memory? Don't repeat them. Instead, delete them. Let the hurts go. Forgive and get on with your life. When we get hurt, we tend to repeat that hurt in three ways. Emotionally in our minds, relationally as a weapon, and practically by telling other people. First, we repeat it by going over and over it in our mind. But resentment is self-destructive. It only perpetuates the pain. It never heals. It never solves anything. Whatever you think about most is what you move toward. If all you think about is how much you've been hurt in the past, then you'll only move toward the past. But if you focus on the future, then you'll move toward the future. If you focus on potential, then you'll move toward the potential. Second, we repeat our hurt in relationships. We use hurt as a wedge and a weapon. We say things like, Remember when you did that? Or, But you did this. The Bible says in Proverbs 17, 9, Love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. Nagging also parts marriages and every other relationship you have. Nagging doesn't work. Third, we repeat our hurt by telling it to other people. It's called gossip. We tell everybody else except God and the person with whom we have the problem. God hates gossip as much as he hates pride because that's what gossip is. Gossip is pure and simple ego, or trying to make ourselves look and feel better. Every time you share gossip, you are being prideful, and God hates pride and gossip. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't repeat a wound so that it turns into resentment, or gossip, or pride. Mark 11.25 says, Whenever you pray, Forgive anything you have against anyone. Then your Father in heaven will forgive your failures. This verse in the Amplified Bible says to let it go. L responds to hurt by letting it go. Some people always want their own way. They've got a right way and a wrong way to do something, and your way is always the wrong way. When you don't meet their standards, they're going to let you know about it and it always seems you can never quite please them. So how do you respond in love to demanding people? The Bible tells us that patience comes from perspective. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs 19.11 NIV The more you understand a person, their background, battles, and burdens, the more patient you're going to be with them. We often look at people and think, look how far they have to go. But we don't stop and say, I wonder how far they've come. Maybe they were raised in a family where they had no model of kindness or courtesy. Maybe they grew up in a very dysfunctional home 
and it's a miracle, really, that they made it this far. What are the burdens they're carrying? They may be sick. They may have a family issue. They may have just lost their job. There are all kinds of battles and burdens people carry that you and I don't know about. Proverbs 19.11 tells us to overlook offenses. Do you overlook offenses, or are you offended by offenses? Are you so touchy and irritable that you're offended by anybody who looks at you funny or forgets to say something or doesn't see you? Love lets it go. The Bible says, Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love is understanding, not demanding. And it's what you would want others to do to you when you're having a bad day, or don't feel well, or are carrying heavy burdens. Does that mean you're just supposed to let people run over you? Do you just let them push you around? Do you act like a doormat, cave in, and let them say whatever they want? No. Here's the key. Be tender without surrender. Jesus never caved in to manipulators, the religious leaders and Pharisees who were extremely demanding and legalistic. They had all kinds of demands that they themselves couldn't even keep. But Jesus did not let demanding people push him into a corner. That's what you call love in action. We all have different amounts of energy, wealth, and talent. But key all have the same exact amount of time, 168 hours a week. You can always get more money, but you can't get more time. You only have a certain number of allotted days, so you have to decide, what is your time worth? The most valuable thing you can give someone is your attention. When you give attention to somebody, you're saying, you matter to me. You are valuable. You are worth listening to. You are worth my time. Jesus said that the essence of relationships is not what we do for each other or the things we give to each other. The essence of true, loving relationships is how much we give of ourselves to another person. The best expression of love is time. The Bible says in 1 John 3.18, We must show love through actions that are sincere, not through empty words. Many parents have been known to say, I give my family everything they need. I'm a good provider. We live a very comfortable life. What more do they want? They want you. Only you can give them your time. Nothing can compensate for time. No amount of gifts, money, or clothes. Kids don't need things. They need parents. Another video game is not the answer. They need you. How do you find more time for the people who love you and that you need to love? Turn off the TV and put away your phone. People will scroll through social media instead of making friends in person. They'll watch reality shows about somebody else's family instead of working on the reality of their own family. Ephesians 5.2 says, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Love means giving up. It means I give up my agenda for your agenda. It means I give up my time for your time. It means I give up my preference for your preference. It means I give up what I'd rather do right now to do what you'd rather do right now. That is a sacrifice. That is love. The Bible teaches this about love. Love is a choice and a commitment. You choose to love and you choose not to love. Today we've bought into this myth that love is uncontrollable, that it just kind of happens to you. In fact, even the language we use implies that we can't control how we love. We say, I fell in love, like it was a ditch. I was just walking along one day and bam, I fell in love. I just couldn't help myself. But is that really love? No. What someone really means when they say they fell in love is that they were attracted to someone. 
Attraction and arousal are uncontrollable, no doubt about it. But attraction and arousal are not love. They can lead to love, but they are not love. Love is a choice. During a wedding ceremony, a man and a woman stand before each other and say their vows. They say to the other person, I choose you above everybody else in the world, and I choose you for the rest of my life. They make a public statement of their choice. That's a commitment. You can't force somebody to fall in love with you, and you can't force him or her to stay in love with you. Why? Because love is a choice. Love cannot be forced. This is true of all relationships, including your relationship with God. Deuteronomy 30, 20 says, You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. Just like in any other relationship, you must choose to love God. God isn't going to force you to love Him. You can thumb your nose at God and go a totally different way. You can destroy your life if you want to. God won't force you to love Him because love is a choice. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Ephesians 4, 26, 27 Anger is a strong feeling we all experience, but it's not automatically a bad thing. What matters is how we handle it. We should try to avoid sinning when we're angry. This means finding constructive ways to deal with our anger instead of letting it control us and making us act or speak in harmful ways. One important thing to remember is to not hold on to our anger for too long. We should try to resolve conflicts and make peace quickly. If we let our anger build up or linger, it can lead to bitterness and divide us from others. We have to deal with it promptly to prevent it from causing more harm. By dealing with our anger promptly, we can prevent it from causing more harm. We should also be careful not to give the devil a chance to influence us through our anger. The devil can use our anger to drive U.S. away from good things like forgiveness, compassion, and understanding. Instead, we should resist the devil's tricks and choose to respond with love, grace, and reconciliation instead of anger and resentment. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Ephesians 5, 8 ESV This passage emphasizes the significance of God's saving grace and its power in our lives. Our sinful nature, characterized by darkness and disobedience, is no longer our defining reality. Instead, we are called to live according to our new identity as children of light. Being children of light means that our lives should reflect the virtues and qualities of Christ. We are called to walk in righteousness, living out our faith in a way that brings glory to God and bears witness to His transformative work in us. Just as light dispels darkness, our lives should radiate love, kindness, and mercy, revealing the difference that Christ has made in our hearts. Living as children of light is not solely dependent on our own efforts or abilities. It is only by the continuous work of the Holy Spirit that we are able to walk in righteousness. We must humbly rely on God's grace, seeking His guidance and strength each day. Through prayer, the study of God's Word, and serving Him, we grow in our understanding and experience of God's grace as it shapes and molds us into the image of Christ. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Titus 1.15 ESV this verse prompts us to reflect upon the importance of purity, both in our thoughts and in our actions. 
Purity is not something we can achieve on our own. Instead, it is a gift from God that requires His work in our lives to make us better. Before we placed our faith in Jesus Christ as He is our Savior, our minds and consciences were defiled by sin. Our thoughts, desires, and actions were influenced by the fallen nature of this world. But through God's grace, He revealed His truth to us, and we were made new. The Holy Spirit began the process of sanctification within us, leading us towards a life of purity. This verse reminds us that a pure heart perceives purity in all things. It is not corrupted or deceived by the sinful nature of our world. However, for those who remain defiled and unbelieving, their perception is clouded and distorted. Their thoughts and conscience are controlled by sin, pushing them further away from true purity. So, as followers of Christ, let us strive continuously for purity in both our thoughts and actions. We must guard our hearts against the influence of a corrupt world, knowing that God calls us to live differently. The Apostle Paul highlights this in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Galatians 3.29 ESV In Galatians 3, Paul emphasizes that through faith in Christ, we become part of the family of God, the heirs to God's promises, just like Abraham. Salvation does not come as a result of our own merit, works, or adherence to the law. Instead, it is entirely a gracious gift bestowed upon us by God's sovereign choice and His unmerited favor. Abraham, in the Old Testament, serves as a remarkable example of faith and trust in God's promises. Our inheritance as believers is not based on any ethnic, cultural, or social factors, but solely on the fact that we belong to Christ. As descendants of Abraham by faith, we are joint heirs with Christ, sharing in the blessings of the covenant made with Abraham and ultimately with all believers throughout history. As believers in Christ, we are the beneficiaries of this promise. We are both graciously grafted into the covenantal relationship that God initiated with Abraham and counted among his offspring. This inheritance brings immense spiritual blessings, including forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the hope of eternal life. Being heirs according to promise means that we have been given an extraordinary birthright. We are no longer slaves to sin and the ways of the world, but have been set free to live in fellowship with God. We have been adopted into God's family as His beloved children, with all the privileges, blessings, and responsibilities that accompany this status. In Christ, we have an eternal inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. 1 Peter 1.4 For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Galatians 1.10 ESV pleasing God, not people. Paul always preached the truth God had revealed and held none of it back for fear he might offend someone. As far as his message was concerned, he did not try to please anyone but Christ. He knew that no one can be a true servant of Christ if he is not willing to preach the whole message of Christ, whether men like it or not. But in other matters, he was willing to please men in order to win them to Christ or help them grow in Christ. 
we should follow him in both these ways. Living a life that honors and glorifies God is our primary purpose as believers. Rather than seeking validation from others, we should wholeheartedly submit to God's will. When we prioritize people's acceptance over God's approval, we compromise our ability to faithfully serve Christ. Today, society often pressures us to conform to others' expectations and opinions. The desire to please people, win their approval, and fit into their mold can be overwhelming. However, as believers, our worth and identity come solely from God. Pleasing Him is what truly matters, as His opinion of us has eternal significance. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Galatians 2.21 ESV Breaking Free from Self-Imposed Standards this verse focuses on the fundamental understanding that our salvation and righteousness come not from our own deeds or efforts to abide by the law, but solely through the grace of God, made manifest in the person and work of Jesus Christ. As believers in Jesus, it is tempting for us to fall into the trap of self-reliance or placing excessive emphasis on our human abilities. We may unknowingly slip into the mindset that our adherence to religious rituals or strict obedience to moral codes can earn us salvation or favor with God. But Galatians 2.21 serves as a reminder that this is a faulty understanding. Salvation is a gift from God, freely given and unmerited by any works or deeds we may undertake. It is by God's grace alone that we are justified, forgiven, and reconciled to Him. Our righteous standing in God's eyes depends entirely on Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, where He bore the weight of our sins and offered Himself as the ultimate and complete atonement. This truth should not diminish our responsibility to live according to God's commands or dismiss the importance of holiness in our lives. However, it should make us feel very thankful for the grace we get because of Jesus. We are called to respond to this grace with faith, repentance, and an earnest desire to live out our faith in obedience to God's will. Therefore, I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Matthew 12, 31 ESV Understanding the Unforgivable Blasphemy Against the Spirit At first glance, these words may appear daunting, seemingly emphasizing the severity of a particular sin. But, Let's delve deeper into its true meaning. From the context, it appears that this one unforgivable sin, the blaspheming against God's Holy Spirit, is this, saying that the works of the Holy Spirit done by Christ are works of Satan. This involves a conscious, determined, willful rejection of Christ. Jesus, in his wisdom, reminds us that all sins and blasphemies can be forgiven when we humbly seek forgiveness and turn toward His redeeming love. God's infinite mercy reaches down to rescue us from the darkest depths and offers us the opportunity for genuine transformation. Let's reflect on the redemption Christ brings through His sacrifice. Let us recognize that the unforgivable blasphemy against the Spirit spoken of in this verse is more a willful and ongoing rejection of God's divine love and mercy rather than a specific act. It is the persistent hardening of our hearts and refusal to accept the work of the Holy Spirit that prevents us from receiving God's forgiveness and grace. It reveals a heart so hardened as to have no desire for repentance and to be incapable of it. And without repentance, there can be no forgiveness. For if anyone thinks he is something 
When he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Galatians 6, 3, 5 ESV Self-Reflection and Accountability In these verses, the Apostle Paul urges us not to think too highly of ourselves, but to carefully examine our own actions and motivations. He reminds us that we are not the ultimate judges of our own worth and value, for there is a higher authority who sees and knows all. Paul emphasizes that we will each have to bear our own burdens, and we cannot escape the consequences of our actions. This passage calls us to adopt a humble and self-reflective mindset. It reminds us that human nature tends to drift toward self-centeredness, pride, and an inflated sense of importance. However, as followers of Christ, we are called to live by a different standard. Apart from the grace of God, we are utterly lost and incapable of saving ourselves. Our salvation is solely dependent on God's mercy and the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Understanding this truth should lead us to a place of humility, recognizing that we have nothing to boast about in ourselves, but everything to be grateful for in God's grace. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Ephesians 4, 19, 20 ESV From Sensuality to Holiness In these verses, the Apostle Paul speaks of those who have become callous, giving themselves up to sensuality, greed, and every kind of impurity. He states that they have lost all sensitivity to the values and principles that bring life and peace, having become hardened in their waywardness. However, as believers in Christ, we are called to embrace a different path, one marked by transformation and renewal. We should understand that it is God's grace that breaks through our callousness and leads us to redemption. None of us are exempt from the lure of worldly desires or the grips of sin. And yet, through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we are given the opportunity to be made new. Our lives are no longer governed by earthly cravings, but are instead invigorated by the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. We also should know that salvation is not merely an intellectual, emotional experience, but a life-altering encounter with the living God. It calls us to actively reject the empty and destructive ways of the world and instead walk in accordance with God's will. It encourages us to constantly pursue righteousness, holiness, and purity, knowing that our true satisfaction and fulfillment come from living in union with our Creator. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. Galatians 6, 3, 4 ESV Examining Ourselves do we tend to compare our own spiritual progress with others, potentially leading to feelings of superiority? Galatians 6, 3, 4 reminds us to honestly examine ourselves without bias. It shows us that we shouldn't think we're better than others, but instead we have to recognize our weaknesses, limits, and how much we need God's grace. We should be humble and admit that without God's love and mercy, we're actually nothing. If we think we are better than other believers, or that our ministry is superior to theirs, this will promote pride. And pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16.18 We should not fool ourselves. Once we start thinking highly of ourselves and believing we're great, we lose touch with reality. 
we are to evaluate our own actions, motivations, and attitudes. It's important to honestly examine ourselves. Galatians 5.26 also says, Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul begins to speak of keeping in step with God's Spirit in some very practical matters. The Spirit hates conceit, strife, and envy, and so should we who want to walk with Him. They are works of the flesh. We should instead focus on becoming more like Christ, which is an ongoing process called sanctification. By looking at ourselves closely, we can find areas where we're not doing well and need to grow. This helps us focus on improving ourselves instead of bragging about how great we think we are, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 ESV Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. This statement serves as a reminder for us to prioritize righteousness in our thoughts, actions, and intentions. As believers, we bear not only the name of the Lord, but also the responsibility to live in a way that reflects His character. As the verse also states, the Lord knows those who are His. It's because if a person practices evil and yet claims to be a Christian, there is reason to doubt the reality of his faith. To truly depart from iniquity means actively turning away from sinful ways, striving to walk in accordance with God's will. It demands that we recognize the temptations and vices that often entice us, prompting us to challenge our own inclinations and seek transformation through Christ's redeeming love. Admittedly, this task may seem daunting, for we are all flawed and prone to making mistakes. Nonetheless, our focus should rest upon progress, not perfection. It is through our sincere efforts, guided by the Holy Spirit, that we grow in righteousness and witness positive change both within ourselves and in the world around us. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Ephesians 6.10 ESV Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Sometimes in life we face tough situations that can make us feel weak and tired. We may think we don't have what it takes to overcome these challenges. The truth is, we really don't have what it takes outside God's help. Without God, we can do nothing. Ephesians 6.10 tells us that we can find strength in God's power. This means asking God for help and understanding that His strength is much greater than our own. We can't overcome our weaknesses and limitations by ourselves. We have to rely on God's strength alone. The verse tells us to trust in the strength of His might because it is stronger than anything we can do on our own. When we choose to rely on God's strength, it shows that we depend on Him. Our faith becomes a big part of our lives, shaping how we see things and how we act. We can talk to God through prayer, think about His words, and have a close relationship with Him. This helps us to access His strength. We sometimes forget that God is not far away, but is like a loving Father who wants to see us thrive. He is always there to help us. By relying on His strength, we can find courage when we are afraid, keep going when we are tired, and make wise choices when things are hard. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leaves the whole lump. Galatians 5, 7, 9 
ESV guarding against false teachings. These verses remind us of the importance of remaining steadfast in our faith, avoiding the false teachings, and staying on course with the truth found in Christ. Paul acknowledges that the Galatian church had once been on the right path, but something or someone has come along and derailed them from the true gospel. Likewise, in our lives, we may find ourselves on a spiritual journey, running well in our faith, until something or someone causes us to stumble. The lesson we can draw from this passage is the importance of staying rooted in the truth of God's Word and not being persuaded by false teachings or distractions. As believers in Christ, our relationship with Him is deeply personal, and it's crucial that we guard ourselves against anything that might hinder our obedience to the truth. This includes being mindful of the messages we allow into our lives, whether it be through books, media, or even the opinions and teachings of others. It's important to filter everything through the lens of God's Word and seek His guidance through prayer. Paul also encourages the Galatians by saying, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Galatians 5, 9 ESV He uses the analogy of leaven, which represents false teachings and influences that can quickly spread and corrupt the entire community of believers. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians 5.13 ESV Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. The freedom we have through Christ's sacrifice on the cross doesn't mean we can do whatever we want and give in to our selfish desires. Instead, this freedom allows us to live the way God wants us to. This verse reminds us that we are called to freedom. Jesus set us free from being trapped and burdened by sin. Because of this freedom, we can live in a way that honors God and follows His commands. As believers, we are set free from the burdens of sin and the chains of the world. It is a remarkable gift, one that should not be taken lightly. But with this freedom comes a responsibility. We must not use our freedom as an excuse to satisfy our selfish desires or indulge in sinful behaviors. We need to be careful not to think that freedom means we can selfishly chase after our own desires. The world tells us that freedom is all about living for ourselves and doing whatever feels good. But that's not what the Bible says. As followers of Christ, we are called to a higher standard. Our freedom should lead us to love and help others. Just like Paul said, serving others means being humble, thinking about their needs before our own, and showing them kindness. It means not being focused on what we want, but on what makes others happy and helps them grow. In a world that only cares about getting ahead, the Bible reminds us to love and serve others, just like Jesus did. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. Ephesians 4.15 ESV we are to grow up in every way into Christ. This passage reminds us of the importance of growing in our faith and becoming more like Christ in everything we do. Growing into Christ means taking intentional steps to develop our character, values, and actions to match His teachings and example. It involves self-reflection, recognizing areas where we need to improve and making changes with love, compassion, and integrity. One essential part of growing into Christ is nurturing our relationship with God. This means spending time praying to Him, seeking His guidance, and studying His Word. The more we read the Bible, the more we can understand how Jesus taught us to live, how He sacrificed Himself, and the purpose He has for our lives. 
As we learn and grow, Jesus helps us become the kind of people he wants us to be. Growing up in every way into Christ is a journey that never ends. It takes time, effort, and a strong commitment to personal growth. We need to align our lives with what Jesus taught us, spend time with God, be humble and selfless, and forgive others. By doing these things, we can continue growing in our faith and becoming more like Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Philippians 3.19 ESV, The Pitfalls of Materialism The verse in question warns us that there are those who, sadly, prioritize earthly indulgences and make them the center of their existence. They dwell in materialism, seeking temporary pleasures, and their ultimate end is destruction. When it says, they glory in their shame, it means that in their terrible spiritual ignorance, they boast about things that should make them ashamed. They're valuing the wrong things. They admire and find satisfaction in behaviors that are wrong, dishonest actions, or cheating. Their desires are not for spiritual things, no matter how much they may speak or preach about them, but for the passing things of this world. 1 John 2.16 Money, possessions, prestige, popularity, satisfaction of the desires of the body, these they love and pursue. This is the broad way which leads to destruction. This leads to problems and stops us from growing. Glorifying these shameful actions prevents us from finding real happiness and peace in life. Similarly, having minds set on earthly things means focusing too much on the temporary and physical things around us. While material possessions might bring temporary happiness, they can't fulfill us deeply. If we only chase after these worldly desires, we might feel empty and without purpose. Please subscribe our YouTube channel to reach 50,000 divine subscribers very soon. Please share this video to 10 people if you believe in God Jesus and share super thanks. Type Amen to affirm thanks for watching.